All right, thank you very much. My name is Dennis. Uh, I'm from the University of Vasa. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the cyclicality of, of bank liquidity creation. This is a co authored uh, work with Susanna and Warren. So that's why I expect a couple of extra minutes for presentation since you're co authored. Mm -hmm. um, no, ju just kidding. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, before before I actually tell you what the paper is about, and before I actually kind of bring in the motivation, uh, uh, I thought that I'll go through the both kind of the, the, the title of the paper consists of the two two parts. So it's the cyclicality and the, the bank liquidity creation. So I thought it would be interesting uh, to explain why should we care about these things in general, right? So the first thing is, is the cyclicality, right? So the cyclicality of bank behavior is in general quite, quite important as it has really big implications and very, very important implications for the financial stability in general. So uh, from the regulator's point of view, of course, there is a first so-called first round effects, which means that the obviously economic conditions affect the bank performance. Uh, this is what is called the cyclicality of the bank performance and so on and so forth. But then there are also the so-called the second round effects. And that means that uh, the bank's reaction to the, to the economic condition uh, may actually amplify these, these economic conditions. So they might, might actually increase or decrease, so it depends which way you're going, the, or, uh, to make it better or worse the, the economic conditions in general. So uh, this part, especially this part, is particularly interesting because it wasn't really exam examined that, that much in the sense of the literature. Okay, and then about the bank liquidity creation. So uh, the important thing here is, is, is not to mix the liquidity creation by banks with the liquidity of the bank itself. Okay, so when we're talking about the bank liquidity, we're talking about the ability of the bank to meet the obligations without having to liquidate, liquid, liquidate other assets. So they're normally based on the very simple ratios uh, like, for example, cash and cash-like uh, type of assets to total assets. Um, but yeah, there, there are of course the regulators try to, to improve this measure. So since 2015, there is a new ratio called liquidity coverage ratio. And this is the part of the, of the stress test in the, in the Basel III. Uh, so basically what it, it is about is that uh, this, this leverage coverage ratio requires 100% coverage of the anticipated cash net outflows over over the next 30 days, right? Very good ratio, very nice intuition, but only one problem. So if you are not um, um, kind of, if, if you don't really have uh, the, the, let's say, the prospects, the, the detailed uh, documented prospects of the bank, how would you measure this 30-day period of anticipated uh, costs? Well, one way is to look at the historic data and then try to try to come up with the with the uh, some sort of ex expected 30-day uh, expenses. But what's the point? I mean, what's the point of looking at the historic uh, 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 information if there is some sort of a shock uh, for for forthcoming? So from that perspective, it's it's. It's really, it doesn't really measure how the, how the bank absorbs the shocks, the, the forthcoming shock on the economy and so on and so forth. So, so that's why uh, uh, some people say that there is, a, there is a maybe slightly better measure of the, of the liquidity and, and that's why um, uh, we're looking at it as well. So it's about the bank liquidity creation, right? So essentially it's the uh, qualitative assets transformation uh, by creating liquidity, banks actually makes makes itself illiquid. So basically, it takes something uh, which is not liquid for the public, and then transfers it, transfers it, and makes it very liquid for the public. Okay, I have a very nice uh, picture here explaining how it works. So uh, let's imagine the word world without the banks. So if if uh, uh, somebody needs money, somebody needs a loan, it will hit the public and ask for this loan. So without the bank. This loan would remain illiquid. So basically, basically uh, the depositors they cannot withdraw this this loan from the from the from the company. So uh, uh, for them, it will be really illiquid asset, right? So and it's a liquid kind of relatively illiquid asset for or or, or liability for a firm because it's usually long long in maturity. So with the bank uh, in the system, 
the deposit depositors they have this ability to, to withdraw their funds, right? Uh, uh, so it's rather liquid for them, but it remains kind of liquid. So so the banks essentially the banks take illiquid from the from the market and then turn it to the liquid asset or liability depends what what side you are looking at. So uh, why should we care about it? Well, besides measuring these assets on maturity and risk transformation, uh, there is some evidence that uh, uh, the liquidity creation by banks actually enhances the economic activity and growth uh, by facilitating these transactions between the lenders and borrowers. And then also, uh, uh, there is an argument that the, the liquidity creation uh, by banks is a more kind of complex, or some people call it more superior uh, measure of the bank output. Okay, so before we know that the literature was focusing mostly on the bank lending or some other t asset side of the bank output, but not really considering both sides, both sides of the of the picture. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's why uh, uh, well, the reverse kind of of the bank liquidity creation measure was given by Alan Berger and uh, Christa Baumann just a few years ago, and uh, and uh, they actually it's it's it's. The quotation is from their book, where they call it the superior measure of the bank output. So they, they consider, uh, um, or they say that the bank liquidity creation consider all bank activities, both on and off balance sheets, uh, instead of just looking at the assets or the lending side of the, of the bank activity. And then it recognizes both liquidity creation and liquidity destruction at the same time, in, just in one measure. OK, well, let me just skip this one. So. Um, a little bit how, how this uh, liquidity creation measure is calculated. So essentially, it just uses the information from the balance sheet of the bank, right? So uh, the, the liquidity creation, uh, in order to calculate the liquidity creation measure, you need to classify all the items that are on the balance sheet as liquid, semi-liquid, or illiquid based on the A's and the, and the cost and the time necessary to turn into liquid funds. Right? And then it weights the assets and liabilities according to their classifications. So more formally, this is how we calculate the liquidity creation matter. Okay, and this is very in line. Of course, this is a very kind of adjusted model because we use uh, uh, slightly different data, but essentially it's really similar to, to the original bank liquidity creation measure by, proposed by Berger et al. So uh, we have the liquid assets, we have semi-liquid assets, and then we have uh, liquid assets. So we consider kind of each item on the balance sheet, we try to categorize them based on these kind of specifications, okay? We use also another measure of liquidity creation based on maturity, where we take into account how, for how, how, what's the maturity of the loans and the deposits and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about it here, but uh, the, the main thing is that this is pretty much the equation how, how the liquidity creation is calculated. So if you want to have more details, please ask Susanna. Susanna is an expert in liquidity creation, so she, she will happily answer your questions for all of them. Um, so anyways, this paper, uh, it focuses more about the, on the, on the uh, cyclicality, okay? So uh, we investigate the cyclicality of bank liquidity creation, and given the key function of banks as, as the liquidity creators, cyclicality of this bank liquidity creation uh, um, can generate some, well, desirable or sometimes undesirable effects in the economy by amplifying, for example, recessions, right? So um, as far as we know, there is absolutely no work uh, that has ever examined how bank liquidity creation reacts to the business cycle fluctuation. So in a sense, we're the first ones here. And uh, moreover, we also analyze the difference in the cyclicality of liquidity creation based on the bank types. So more specifically, we look at the, at the ownership. So is there any difference in the liquidity creation by, by state-owned banks, for example, or foreign-owned banks, and so on and so forth. So there is a literature that, as I mentioned before, uh, focusing only on the lending, uh, including my own paper, uh, I was looking at the lending of state on, on, on bank and the private on bank, but uh, as I mentioned before, it might be really one-sided because the lending does not really capture the whole picture of the, of the, of the kind of bank output in a sense. Okay, yeah, so we, we try to do the same as people do for lending, but we do it for the liquidity creation. All right, the data. So we use all Russian banks 
Um, uh, normally here, I, I have to spend several minutes trying to explain why we use Russian data and so on and so forth. So I guess I don't really have to do it here. But uh, yeah, so we use the quarterly financial statements covering uh, the period from 2004 to 2015. So basically, the data comes from the Central Bank of Russia. It's officially published on their web page. Um, so this is this data is pretty much as detailed as it gets, at least in the public sources. Okay, so probably the bank itself has more detailed classifications and so on and so forth, and more trustworthy numbers. But uh, but uh, essentially, this is as detailed data as it as it can be uh, on the, on the, in the public sources. All right, so we have the final sample of over 38,000 bank quota observations for over 1,200 individual banks, okay? Um, yeah, so we use two alternative measures of liquidity creation. We, we, have, we categorize them based on the category of the assets and, and liabilities, and then we also categorize them based on the maturity of the assets and liabilities. And essentially, we, use, we start with the two-way fixed effects and subventions. So we regress change in liquidity creation measure on the change in the macroeconomic indicator of the business cycle. So we use two alternative ones, GDP growth per capita and the real investment growth. This, this approach is all right, as it, as it showed, showed out. But there is a problem. There might be a problem on the endogeneity, obviously. And there, the, the, probably the bigger problem is that it's pretty much this static model. So it doesn't really account for the dynamic adjustment of the bank to the, towards the macroeconomic conditions. So that's why we have to step into the, to the uh, system GMM estimation, so dynamic two-step system GMM. And then we include the, include the lag dependent variable to the right-hand side of the equation. And then we use the different kind of variables as the instruments in order to account for the, for the endogeneity. Okay, so don't worry, I'm not going to tell you about the descriptive statistic. I just wanted to show you the, the control variables because they're not on my main results over here uh, table. So uh, this is pretty much what we have. So we have the a change in the liquidity creation two times. We have the, we also look at the lending essentially, but uh, we have the GDP growth, we have the real investment, and then those are our bank specific control variables. So we use the size, the equity assets, the non-performing loans ratios, and the loans to asset ratios. And then we have the two dummies for, for ownership. Okay? We look at the, we, did, we kind of distinguish between the state-owned and foreign-owned banks. And those are the main results. So uh, they're quite easily summarized in one graph. So, uh, and as you can see probably, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a cyclicality. <laughs> In a sense, so uh, the red line over here is the GDP growth, the change in the GDP per capita, and now we have the liquidity creation, change in the liquidity creation. So you kind of kind of notice that they look pretty much the same way. Okay, so the liquidity creation by banks, by all the banks in Russia, is kind of cyclical. All right, so those are the more formal results with the numbers. So we have the GDP growth here. We have the liquidity creation on the left hand side. So you can see that the coefficient is positive and st statistically highly statistically significant pretty much through, through the old specification. So I don't include the full table here, otherwise you wouldn't see much. But, but uh, essentially, yeah, so basically those are the first main results of the paper. So the, the liquidity creation by banks is cyclical. The interesting thing, though, is that when we introduce the uh, or when we look, when we want to look at the specific type of the bank, we 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 don't really find anything significant here. So you can see that the state ownership uh, dummy is not significant, and then also the interaction of the state ownership with the, with the GDP growth is not significant. Well, it's negative, but it's not really it's not really statistically significant. So we don't really focus or stay pay much of the attention over here. And the same happens for the foreign ownership in here. All right, so. Yeah, so then we're kind of interested in the symmetry of the cyclicality if it's, if it's kind of equally cyclical in the, in the times of the GDP growth and if it's, if it's uh, the same in the times of the negative GDP growth. In the sense. So we, we kind of split the GDP growth variable into two, so we have the positive and the negative. So, uh, and the results show that yes, it is actually, it is actually the quite symmetric. Okay, so you have to be careful here because this is the 
this is the variable negative GDP growth. So we got the positive coefficient, but you have to remember that the, the this variable is always negative. Okay, so it should be interpreted as the around. So it's, it's negative here. Um, yeah. So again, nothing nothing really for um, uh, for the state ownership and for the interaction terms. Well, we do find a really really kind of marginal. Uh, evidence for the foreign ownership would be ne in, in times of negative GDP growth. So it might be that the foreign banks during the economic downturns have a little bit less uh, uh, pro-cyclical than the other banks. Okay, robustness tests we do we do with the same uh, uh, setup. We do the same estimations for the other liquidity measure based on the maturity. Uh, virtually the same results. We do the same thing with the other business cycle indicator. Uh, with the real investment growth, virtually the same results. So, so in that sense, we kind of think that we found quite a robust evidence. Okay. Finally, as the final, as the kind of additional test, we we want to look if we do everything correct, and we do the same thing with the with the lending. Um, and yes, we found that the lending is also cyclical, as it was found before. By, by other papers, uh, and we do find an evidence that's, that the lending by state-owned banks, for example, and, and well, actually in this case we found both that state-owned and foreign banks are a little bit less uh, pro-cyclical than the other private domestic banks. banks. Um, uh, yeah, and then we also test for the for the symmetry of the of the cyclicality, and it seems like. Uh, at least the state-owned banks are less procyclical only during the times of the negative GDP growth. So when the, when the economy is in trouble, then the state-owned banks step up, step step up, and try to be counter-cyclical, but not in the good times. All right. But in case of the foreign-owned banks, it actually it actually goes both ways. So during the positive and negative, they are uh, a little bit less cyclical than the than the other banks. Okay. Well, this is just an illustration how the lending goes with, uh, with the with the GDP growth. So I have the green line here, which is the state ownership, state owned banks, and then the uh, blue line here is the foreign owned banks. So you can see that there is actually, in fact, if you look at this, at this period over year, 2007, 2008, there is, in fact, they, there was a decline in the GDP growth, but a slight uptick for the foreign and state ownership, state owned banks. Conclusions. So. Uh, well, first of all, we found that liquidity creation of banks is cyclical. Uh, um, this this kind of wasn't really documented before, so that's why we, we strike it out uh, uh, on purpose. And But uh, what is more interesting, probably, at least to me, is that state-owned banks, they do not have a more or less pro-cyclical liquidity creation behavior than domestic private banks. So the previous literature kind of found that, okay, state ownership might be beneficial especially during the, the times of the negative GDP growth. Uh, so that's why maybe state ownership is not that bad. But if you look at the more complex measure of the bank output, if you're, if you're not really looking at only at the lending channel, but also at the, at the in general, the liquidity creation for the market by banks, we find that there is actually no difference of the state-owned banks and other banks, okay? And we find some evidence to support that foreign-owned banks tend to have a little bit lower pro-cyclicality of liquidity creation during, during the economic downturns. All right, so the main takeaways here is that bank behavior and liquidity creation can, can actually amplify the business cycle fluctuation. So this is something that regulators might want to look at. So uh, if they want to kind of prevent or, or, or make banks able to absorb the sh sh shocks uh, in a better way, so maybe this liquidity creation is something that they can can look at in addition to other their measures that they, that they came up during the Basel meetings. So um, yeah, and then there also the previous evidence on the counter cyclicality of lendings by the state-owned banks maybe one-sided as uh, state ownership doesn't really matter for cyclicality of the of the liquidity creation. Yeah, so this is very first uh, draft of the paper actually, and this is the first time it's been presented. So. Any any comments on the paper are more than welcome to thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you, Susanna, and thank you, organizers, for inviting me. Um, I'm, uh, I was enjoying reading this paper, as I usually must say that it is clearly written, as usual, and uh, the idea is quite <coughs> easy to understand, and uh, well, the paper is uh, good structured. So. I will not uh, pay attention to the uh, to the main idea as this is quite uh, it's just uh, said it uh, so <clears throat> what I would like to say is that our uh, first of all um, the authors uh, they um, uh, they uh, discuss the the, the idea of the procyclical behavior of banks, and they uh, compare themselves uh, to the literature, for example, in the introduction of the paper. Here in presentation, it was omitted for uh, this discussion. But when I, uh, when I read the paper, I saw that there is a uh, very uh, close, uh, close to this uh, paper by Suzanne and uh, Laurent and uh, at, at, at the other co-author, uh, where they said that uh, for Russia, uh, they, they found that, uh, as expected, state-owned banks was uh, less procyclical, while uh, foreign banks were, were more, more procyclical. So the, that was quite with, in line with the intuition for those who study Russian banks. Uh, so, and uh, it, like a common knowledge that uh, state-owned banks could react less procyclical, but uh, foreign banks can withdraw when the condition is not very good, can withdraw for, from the market. So, but in this paper, which we, uh, which we just saw, uh, the, the author find some a little bit different results. Uh, they found that uh, for new measure of liquidity creation, not for lending, but for lending too, uh, foreign banks became uh, more stable during the cycle compared to, to the previous result. So uh, the, the question is, uh, what, the, what is the general conclusion? Okay, for, for state-owned banks, you found uh, less clear evidence. Okay, we don't know. Maybe they are less procyclical, may, maybe not. But for, for foreign banks, you, you, you found a li quite different results. So, could you, could you maybe, I don't know, I would stimulate you to discuss more in the paper why, why, why it happened and what is your general conclusion because uh, in this paper you, you have the same methodology and quite, but a little bit different period but, but still we, we, we would like to know what, what, is, what happened and what is happening in the Russian market for example, maybe at some other emerging markets <coughs> with the foreign ownership. Maybe those results were relevant only for the previous financial crisis where <coughs> the problems was in, uh, in European countries, for example, where the, the Russian foreign banks were originated from and they could, could withdraw money from Russia. But during this crisis that was not the same because we had no problems in Europe, only in Russia, and that's why the, the results changed. So I, I would like just to, to have more discussion of, the, of these differences. So this is the first uh, point. The second is um, uh, you, you try to address the, the issue of procyclicality of, uh, of lending or liquidity creation. For me, it's quite close uh, <coughs> things, but anyway, just uh, to be sure that you you, you really uh, consider the, the cycle, uh, maybe I would uh, suggest you to, to try some other proxy for the state of the business cycle as you, you, you use uh, GDP per capita growth in the paper. Uh, but uh, there are some paper, there is some, uh, this paper that I mentioned here, but some other that, that say that growth rate cycle could uh, disagree with business cycle phases. For example, you you may see a little bit different uh, recession dates, expansion dates when you use the growth rate of some economic variable. And also, <coughs> when you use only GDP, you may uh, you may uh, skip some events uh, in general because GDP is not the only measure of economic activity. Some people 
use uh, composite coincident index of economic activity, some people use industrial production and so on. And also to identify the recession and expansions, you may use uh, the levels of the production and, for example, try to use Bray-Boschen algorithm to identify the phases, not just positive growth or negative as you do. Uh, and also, I saw the, the, this is just a comment on the phrase, you, you, you point that liquidity creation can amplify the business cycle. I'm aware of this wording as, uh, I suggest you to use it more, more, maybe to soften this as, it is uh, that liquidity creation or lending of banks is correlated or associated with the business cycle because you don't know uh, the causal relationship. What is the uh, cause? What is the result uh, when you study business and fi uh, financial cycle? So the the indigenity problem that you can't uh, address here as you study microeconomic data. If you had mi microeconomic data, of course you could identify the shocks, credit market shocks, uh, economic shocks and so on. So just maybe soften or be more cautious with that. This actually comes from, uh, from existing literature, so there is an evidence showing that the liquidity creation affects the economic growth as well in the country. So it's in Berger and, and Carthers, they document that the liquidity creation has the direct link with the, the causal link with the, with, the, with the economic growth as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use this. But, yeah. but still, you say that it amplify. But when I when I see amplify, I mean that you have an original shock and credit markets in perfection they amplify the these original shocks. So this is not the just the, what what you do. I, I would say so. Okay, take take it as yeah. you as you think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now. Well, I can answer the first comment is, uh, the, for the paper with the Risto. I think this is different paper because there's a uh, different time period, uh, different time period, different methodology. So, so I would. It, it's very difficult to compare this. So, we are we are of course talking about this paper, but we can explain it more in the, in the paper. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, and for the other measures that yeah, we were thinking about that until now, we only um, managed to do one robustness check, but we can, we can try some of the others. Mm -hmm. For the right, if I agree. Yeah, so now the questions, or that this was. No, you answered pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I have a, a comment on, so Berger Brahman has fixed weights, and this has been questioned recently by a paper by Jenny Bai and uh, R.P. Kishimoto, and so what they have is actually time varying weights, which is actually much more intuitive, because liquidity adds and flows, and so this Berger Brahman is really potentially problematic and in that paper by buying uh, at all they also have I think here yeah, they related a little bit to the, to the business cycle so you, you probably want to look at that paper okay. and then secondly you also probably want to argue about why Berger Bauman in all its uh, fixity and probably incorrectness would be applicable to Russia because these uh, these ways only come in front of the US are they really yeah, well, that we actually we actually account for that. So the liquidity measure is not exactly the same measure as in Burger and and, and all, but we, it's sort of specially tailored for for the Russian. So the base, the, the yeah, the base the base are the same as well. Yeah, yeah, the base are the same. Okay. <coughs> but then, yeah, this, this is kind of I would say could be quite a long discussion. But yeah, but the measure. Yeah. I mean, if we put some other ways, <coughs> some people. That's why so we, we have to have good reasons. So, yeah. so you, read, you have yeah. to read one by and push yeah. the yeah. It's really okay. quite sophisticated what they do and how they come up with the ways which are then very more Yeah. But it's, I, I'm not sure it's, but it, it's possible to do this for Russia here because you need all sorts of uh, uh, information on, on uh, pricing and uh, retail markets. And, uh, but, uh, so, but look once I have to buy and push the to refer to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, this is my. I haven't read the paper, so looking at the, just at the picture. 
mean, was the data seasonally adjusted or not? Because no, there seems to be a very clear seasonal pattern. So, uh, I mean, you might want to have a, do some seasonal adjustment because otherwise the referee will say that seasonality is driving your results. Just like the dummies, I think. Yeah. Okay. I have a, a conceptual question. So, how do you make the difference between liquid liquidation and flat flight safety? Because you have the crisis time, the depositors are a bit uh, risk averse, they move their depositors away from Russian banks, Russian flat banks to public banks, and the foreign banks. And the measure of liquidity creation, since the deposit is still to the bit, if you look, as if the liquid creation of the public banks and foreign banks increases and those of private banks increases. The only thing that is happening is that the depositors move. So you could only call it the liquid creation if this decision of the bank, above a few results, is driven by a decision of the depositors, then what you have is a flat safety. And you should try to find a way to this bank approach. So I thought what I would like to see is is the result driven by the part of the depositors or by other parts. Is it is, if there's a part of the just the fact that you have free title and pay, if there's something else, it's also then many other different conditions. Because the measure, if it, that's right, that the deposit store you could decrease. Well, uh, they so are creating liquidity, yeah, yeah. they are providing loans. Yes, so the yeah. yeah. So yeah. If, if the deposits move, you will have this effect in the county. But does it does it really matter? I mean, if the bank creates more liquidity, does it really matter from which side it comes? I mean, it does not, but because if it's decision of the depositor, so your results say, kind of say foreign banks are anti cyclical mm -hmm. in their lending behavior, the liquidity question. No, no, depositors just want to form that. Yeah, yeah, it's a very different uh, interpretation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you do you use any clustering of standard errors? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the standard errors are robust. They're clustered based on By what? Cross sections. Dimension. Cross sections. Cross sections. Uh, by cross time, section. you should by quarter. Uh, Why? Because you have macro variables and uh, you have macro and bank level variables. So within uh, one quarter of macro GDP growth, there must be a very serious circulation across banks in the quarter. Cluster by time to account for that. We have conservative standard errors because you have different dimensionality, bank level, bank level. So you should cluster by time. Uh, my hypothesis about uh, foreign banks' puzzle, let, let's uh, call it like this, was that during the crisis, uh, the parent banks could withdraw funds from these, uh, from their uh, foreign banks' uh, subsidiaries in Russia, and due to that, they uh, they were forced to take deposits from Russian market. And in your measure, it would mean that the liquidity increased, liquidity creation increased as they produced liquid uh, liabilities. Yeah, all right. So I agree with Cohen. You should somehow control for this asset composition and liability side of the operations. But what puzzles me uh, also is that when you take uh, uh, lending activity measures as a robustness, which Dennis said at the end of the presentation, the results about foreign banks, they, they hold. So they are still uh, less percyclical. And that, uh, I don't know how to, how to explain it. So that's why I uh, suggested to think about it more Thank you. 
chair when she was answering the question suggested that this might be a long discussion. Well, this discussion might be necessary. Is, uh, well, you know, the previous paper, in, which I liked very much, uh, to much of Kevin as well, uh, suggested something that state banks are less precise actually to their counter cyclical, uh, whereas other market participants are cross cyclical and used like link. Now, in this case, uh, essentially, the results are not wrong. It's okay for Dennis, who was not part of the first team, but, uh, but you know. But I, I think it's, uh, um, I don't agree, because that's yeah. a completely different time period, a uh, completely different methodology. And the measure. I mean, I mean you looked at, at the lending only, right? But, but yeah, exactly the creation, I mean, this is, yeah. I, I, I don't agree that it's really like we, we are saying something else. I have not finished. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's exactly the measure. So when Dennis says, yeah, well, first was lending, and this is more complex, so there are more important things than lending. I wonder what those more important things are. I mean, if lending shows one thing. Now, another measure, which is liquidity creation, which is probably lending also part of, uh, uh, of that, but also something else. But that makes results different. It means that the other components of this liquidity creation play a pretty significant role. I wonder what is it that the banks do, which is useful, and which is changing the picture. And now, if, if lending shows you something, but a true period is different, but actually it's the period of the crisis that matters, right? I mean, in good times, uh, who cares? Now, in period of crisis, it's important who is counter -cycle. This is when the, when the market dries up, when there's no liquidity, this is when it matters. Now, in good times, actually, who cares? Right? So, uh, this discussion actually might be necessary. I don't have an answer to it, but, uh, uh, but uh, this, these papers have to be reconciled. That's the only thing I'm saying.